Is sound okay? Yes. Good evening, everyone from India. Welcome to the India Governance Forum 2022. Today, we launched the 83rd Scotch Summit. Our panel today brings together domain experts to discuss the topic of cooperative federalism. Our session today is organized in honor of Dr. Vijay Kelkar in collaboration with the Forum of Federations of Ottawa. It is my pleasure to now introduce our panelists to you. We have with us Mr. K. M. Chandrasekhar, former cabinet secretary. He's a retired 1970 batch IAS officer from the Kerala cadre and served as the 29th cabinet secretary from 2007 to 2011. He also served as the vice chairman of the Kerala State Planning Board from 2011 to 2016. Mr. Chandrasekhar has also held the posts of revenue secretary in the Ministry of Finance and joint secretary of the Trade Policy Division. We have with us Dr. Vijay L. Kelkar, Chairman of the 13th Finance Commission and Scott Challenger Lifetime Achievement Awardee. He is one of India's preeminent economists. Dr. Kelkar was awarded the Padma Vibhushan in January 2011 for his services to the country. He is a former finance secretary and was advisor to the Minister of Finance from 2002 to 2004. He is popularly known as the architect of GST. Dr. Kelkar has served as the chairperson of the government committee on revisiting and re revitalizing the PPP model of infrastructure development. We have with us Dr. Amar Patnaik, member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha from Odisha, and Scotch awardee. Before becoming a member of Parliament, Dr. Patnaik had a long career in the civil services and is a former CAG official. He was also associated with the United Nations and the World Bank for global external audit assignments. He was also team leader of India's external audit mission to many countries. He has written various papers in national and international journals. We are joined by Professor George Milbrod, Chairman of the Forum of Federations of Ottawa. He is a former Premier of Saxony, Germany, and is Chairman of the Board of the Forum of Federations. He has recently been appointed as Vice President of the Independent Advisory Committee of the German Stability Council. His political career includes being the Minister President of the Federal Free State of Saxony and Chair of Saxony's Christian Democratic Union. He has been a member of the German Bundesrat mm -hmm. as well as the Parliament of Saxony. Dr. Ashok Kumar Lahiri, member of the West Bengal Legislative Assembly and member of the 15th Finance Commission, Dr. Lahiri has previously served as the 12th Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. His other appointments include Reader at the Delhi School of Economics, Chairman of Bandhan Bank, Executive Director at the Asian Development Bank, and Director of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. He's also been associated with the World Bank as a consultant and the International Monetary Fund as a senior economist. We have with us Dr. M. Govinda Rao, economist and member of the 14th Finance Commission. He served as director of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy and director of Institute for Social and Economic Change. He was a member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India, a member of the Financial Sector Legislative Reforms Commission, and high-level expert committee on universalizing healthcare. We have with us Ms. Yamini Ayer, President and Chief Executive Center for Policy Research. In 2008, she founded the Accountability yeah, Initiative at CPR. which is credited with pioneering one of india's largest expenditure tracking surveys for elementary education her work sits at the intersection of research and policy practice her research interests span the fields of public finance social policy state capacity federalism governance and the study of contemporary politics in india we're joined by dr ajay shah author and independent scholar and scotch awardee He has held positions at the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, Indira Gandhi Institute for Development Research, Department of Economic Affairs at the Ministry of Finance, and National Institute for Public Finance and Policy. He does academic and policy-oriented research on India at the intersection of economics, law, and public administration. His second book, co-authored with Dr. Vijay Kelkar, is "In Service of the Republic: The Art and Science of Economic Policy." It was published in 2019. We have Mr. Rupak Chotopadhyay, President and CEO, Forum of Federations, Ottawa. 
Uh, he was earlier a member of the consultative, uh, consultative group on the study of intergovernmental relations and dispute resolution mechanisms, Interstate Council, Government of India. In 2004-05, he was advisor to the chairman of the Observer Research Foundation. Over the last two decades, he has contributed as an expert in support of political and constitutional reforms in Ethiopia, Mexico, Myanmar, Philippines, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Tunisia, and Yemen. Recently, he co-authored a comparative study on apex level intergovernmental relations, World Bank 2019, for submission to the 15th Finance Commission of India. And finally, we have Mr. Sumit Bose, former finance secretary and Scott Awardee. He's a 1976 batch IAS officer who's held several key positions, including revenue in the state and central governments. He served as the Secretary for Expenditure and Secretary for Disinvestment, as well as the Secretary of the 13th Finance Commission. He was a part of the Union Budget Core Group from 2010 to 2015. It's my pleasure to now invite Sri Samir Kocher, Chairman of the Scotch Group, to say a few words. So, Thank you, Brinda. Namaskar to you all. I have enjoyed the pleasure of having Dr. Vijay Kelkar as my mentor my philosopher and my guide, including a guide in my personal life and guide of my children and my family for several years now. I had the privilege of editing a fish shift in his honor and making a documentary film on him. And many years back, he was awarded Scott Challenger Lifetime Achievement Award. He's almost ready for the next one. Uh, you know, I uh, am a child of the reform, as they call it. People try to often question, you know, why I do what I do. I do not have privilege of too much of formal education. I am I studied only till class 12 in school and then I started working as a bellboy and I finished my graduation by correspondence. So to such an erudite panel and such wise men that I have from all over the world, I don't know what to say. But I was thumbing through this book uh, yesterday. I saw this new book. Uh, so I joined, I'll be there. You know, by book by Munash Shofik. She heads the London School of Economics. She's come up with this book called uh, What Do We Owe Each Other? A New Social Contract. And I found some of her ideas interesting and very fascinating. She's talked about, you know, the role of welfare state changing from that of being a Robin Hood, you know, redistribution of wealth to somebody who looks after the people through their life cycles and various phases. If they're old, they're infirm and, you know, they have health issues. I don't know really how practical that is in a country like uh, India at 1.3 billion, but the idea is fascinating that the welfare of people through different stages of the life probably could be at some future state, a government's uh, responsibility as you know, our society changes and our families fragment and the culture undergoes a lot of changing. I hope not. But only area where I see this possible, if it, it is you know done at a decentralized level, at a gram panchayat level, at a municipality level, where it possibly will be easier to build such support systems and hold governments accountable to such uh, social contracts. And those social contracts then could be specific to each city, to the felt need of the people that there are. However, I still feel that uh, you cannot do welfare as a social contract. I do not educate my son because he's going to look after me in, eight, in my old age or a mother doesn't look after the child because she expects to be looked after sometime in the future. You know, we do these things because they're the right thing to do. So I do not know whether morality can become a social uh, contract. Decentralization, on the other hand, certainly can. It's enshrined in our constitution. We've been working on the uh, area for many, many years. And cooperative federalism is something I have seen uh, and uh, pushed for for many years from my visits to Gram Panchayats, to states, and to... Because cooperative federalism doesn't stop at uh, center and state. It is meaningless unless it goes lower than that. So with that, I would leave you in the able hands of Mr. Sumit Bos. Thank you, Sumit. And good evening, everyone. Uh, let the celebrations begin. Well, cooperative federalism requires the interaction among federal units to be geared towards achievement of common goals. So, in a way, we are seeking some normative vision, a normative vision amongst the uh, levels of government. And with this eminent panel that we have by the end of this evening, we should have a much clearer idea of this uh, vision or what it should be like. 
since we have about an hour and now 20 minutes um i propose that we go go around uh, uh, the panel uh, to begin with 5 minutes each and follow it up with another round of say 2 to 3 minutes depending on how much time we have if that's agreed upon then i would now request professor govinda rao to uh, sort of begin the discussions thank you uh, thank you mr bose uh, as you said let the let the celebrations begin at the outset let me thank uh, the scotch foundation for inviting me inviting me to this um, um, very eminent panel of uh, people possibly i will have more to learn than to say um i would also like to compliment dr kilker for many years of his productive contribution to policy making and economic governance of the country um um we wish and pray that he will have many more years to contribute and make all of us learn from what he does let me now uh, straight away talk i see i would like to make some six points uh, let first let me start by saying that the 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 definition of classical definition of liberalism is the method of dealing dividing power so that general and regional governments are each within a sphere of within a sphere are coordinated and independent and it's something like a, a layer cake perspective than a, a, a marble cake perspective if in that case but then that's very difficult to get it's not easy you need to put in a lot of effort to get a co- you know sort of a cooperation in several areas um i am again at the outset want to say that i will mostly talk about not political issues as much as analytical issues um because political issues you know one can always you know do sort of be about but what i understand i learned on federalism i am going to be talking now as i said vertical and, and obviously the classical definition of kenneth vere is not going to is not the one which we see you don't have um, you know sort of coordinate and independent powers so obviously there has to be overlap and there are overlaps the assignment according to comparative advantage necessarily results in overlapping systems and then obviously therefore the cooperation becomes necessary both vertical and horizontal competition is necessary for a smooth functioning of any multi level fiscal system i'm again talking mostly about the fiscal Uh, cooperation rather than political issues in all though from time to time i'll talk about them in actual practice and uh, there are limits to cooperation in fact if you have a complete cooperation then there is no federalism because it's all it's all a unitary sort of a, an arrangement so attempt should be to expand the scope of co- cooperation and um, and as i mentioned comparative advantage results in no overlapping systems and then we need to deal with them when is cooperation possible again analytically if you see cooperation is possible only when the parties have a something to gain from it in fact if some parties gain and some parties lose the parties that gain should be able to compensate the parties that lose and get them you know cough them into the system even in when you know there is when some of the parties gain more than the others there may be it is necessary to bargain you know sort of get them to, together and then have the you know sort of have the cooperation expand the the scope of cooperation in order to have this cop you know sort of the interaction between the the parties to gain from cooperation you need to you need to have an institutional mechanism to reduce the transaction cost of this bargaining the third point that i want to make is in indian context you have the seventh schedule which divides the 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 remits of union state and the con- in in terms of union state and concurrent list the moment you have concurrent list cooperation has to become is becomes necessary and even in the state list what happens is that the union government may think that certain services have to be provided at, you know in minimum standards of ser- certain services must be provided across the country and so it may have to go get into union list and then obviously work on that the question is 
whether you know the the intended minimum level of service and the design and the, this thing which are basically done through the centrally sponsored schemes whether they have they have worked is there a scope for you know improving improving them and a number of other things that will come through some examples of cooperation if you want to see in our country i mean obviously you you know when you have overlapping system there are issues in energy environment education poverty alleviation so on and so forth in cases where the state governments are responsible where the central governments want to ensure a minimum standard of service you you know you may, has to intervene for for betterment of the system is agriculture health urban affairs and so on and so forth so as i said some examples of cooperation are you know in terms of uh, disaster management obviously both of, both the union and the state governments co co cooperate gst council is an important example of uh, the example of you know cooperative cooperation for a long time you had the planning commission when centralized planning was active but then as my guru raja chele has said centralized planning is negation of federalism the point simply is that um, but the planning commission was trying to get the states to adopt the centralized planning there was a cooperation in that sense part of the reason for cooperation is that there was a single party rule for a long time when the political parties are different in the states than the center then there is a problem then you know obviously you know states will complain saying that i you know i don't get i don't get uh, the way i want to do things rather than center is forcing me to do it but after 1991 when market based reforms came even then the the way in which they went about the states agreed to do it and submit their annual uh, planning uh, uh, sort of uh, annual plans but, uh, for the main reason that the central government was giving some money for them you know through the planning commission so in order to get that money obviously they had to do it i mean this that's one of the things so you have the examples um, so you have the centralized planning you have now i mean obviously you have niti ayog now in the niti ayog they say that the, one of the one of the prime uh, uh, prime objectives of the niti ayog is fostering cooperative federalism by providing structured support to states on a continuous basis this is what is said in the, you know sort of in the in the act that uh, created the uh, uh, niti ayog but is niti ayog i i was able to do that planning commission was able to do to a some to certain extent because it provided money niti ayog is it able to do that if it is not able to do as entire developmental blueprint blueprint that it wants to create how is it going to really be effective these are some of the question the finally i mean before we go one more point i say that is cooperation really i mean we, this is a normative concept as sumit both said does it really happen the basic relationship between the governments is one of competition this is a competitive relationship between between the states is the same competition for claim you know the competition both vertical and horizontal competing for the common pool of funds regional policies everybody wants the central project to be located in his in his state or you know so regional policies competing for investments competing for there is a tax competition and you know prior and then passing out the tax burden to the non residents i mean these are some of the examples that you see so basic relationship is one of competition but then there can be predatory competition you in a, in, a, in a system that we exist we do need to have you know in fact this um, um i will explain this competitive federalism in an analytic sense in later when uh, there is some more time but preventing predatory competition would require a certain measure of competitive equality and comp you know cost benefit appropriability and that is something that has to be done and finally let me see whether it is promoting competition whether it is regulating competition or promoting cooperation you need institutions as a set for reducing the transaction cost you need the institutions now unfortunately in our country the institutional mechanism for this is there is a vacuum they i mean to some extent planning commission used to do it they had the national development council which make, make, became a speech making body once in 10 years or once in 20 years 
the you had you created and, um, there was an administrative reforms commission report which said that you need to have an interstate council which was repeated repeated by the sarkaria commission what did we do we located interstate council within the union home ministry now how can it be an empire when it is a player obviously you have you have you have a problem and i mean if you really see the thing it is not that uh, a very uh, some unwanted bureaucrat is going put there in the interstate council to manage it so obviously he doesn't get the response this thing the meetings are not held and most of these meetings they end up in uh, end up in uh, this thing you have a constitution which has lived the, through the time you have a, a reasonably independent judiciary you have a free press and you have all india services and of of late i mean there are also questions about whether all india services supposed to be neutral across the political spectrum there are there are some this thing you have the finance commission you have the gst council and, and so on and so forth which have done but a real institution for intergovernmental bargaining and conflict resolution is conflict resolution and promoting you know you know sort of coordination because competitive federalism is something like a laboratory federalism as they say so you know in fact there is a lot of literature on laboratory federalism which basically is through the competition you gain so but then you require regulation prevent predatory competition and obviously we do not really have an efficient system of reducing the transaction cost of bargaining and coordination thank you thank you professor rao dr amar patnaik uh, uh, yes uh, dr patnaik uh, welcome we didn't uh, see you earlier and uh, i would now invite you because since you have to leave a little early i was told so um, no, a little early actually thank you so okay. much i believe in just 10 minutes to the okay. uh, chicago airport uh, i'm speaking from uh, chicago but thank you so much for uh, inviting me and of course thank you to scotch foundation uh, professor govindra is some, somebody who was in the finance commission when as accountant general i met presentation before him and why we read the about or is a state finances uh, and of course mr kem chandrasekhar was there in the planning board when i was the principal accountant general of kerala uh, i would just make a few points uh, the first thing is i think Federalism itself conceptually is rooted in cooperation. I don't think the term com competitive federalism really makes any sense. The way the constitutional framers had framed the constitution, the centralist, stateless, it was basically designed not for competition. And competition, if you follow even the neoclassical economic mo models anywhere, let's say competition between countries, the GDP hasn't converged anywhere. so i i i think the conceptually it is wrong and then you know the coinages new coinages have come which i have also used in parliament coercive federalism um uh, competitive federal all kinds of stuff but i think it is federalism is conceptually rooted in cooperation number one and that is the reason why india is called union of states it is it, it is it is not a, a monolithic uh, central government which will Uh, have uh, which will treat the states as subordinate uh, agencies because competition gives the sense as if the states are subordinate to the center and the center is the monitor who is uh, engaging people in competition uh, the second point is competitive federalism doesn't take and take care of regional imbalances when there is no level playing field how can you promote competition you cannot have competition of orissa with let's say maharashtra or tamil nadu it just uh, just doesn't make any sense the uh, second aspect uh, i would uh, to talk about it, uh is uh, professor rao talked about uh, central list state list and uh, and and the uh, concurrent and the residual list but the point is the new way of encroaching into states powers and states power to legislate has been by changing some words for example i'll give you the example dams are in the state list but dam safety uh legislation has been brought by the central government because they say that you know they got an opinion from the uh, attorney general saying that dams may be in the state but dam safety is not now i i give you another example the rti the right to information act the states legislated their own rti laws but now when we are talking about the privacy law the data protection law of which i was a member it is the center which is legislating and which i gave a dissent note because i think the states should have the power to appoint their own data protection authorities and have that structure 
The third point I'm going to come is, of course, the most important thing uh, is on fiscal uh, federalism, the amount of resources. And that has been dwindling. Uh, if you take the last budget and current budget, it has decreased from, in terms of, you know, as a percentage of the gross tax revenue uh, divisible pool, it is uh, reducing from 30.02 to it has come to 29.61% in the 22-23 budget. And that is happening because the session surcharge has increased by a phenomenal 17% compared to the last year in 22-23. And I, I, I do not know if you follow the reply to the budget of the finance minister. I had made this point in my budget speech and she replied quite extensively by saying that this session surcharge that we are collecting is ultimately being sp spent for the states. But then it is like the pater familias deciding that, you know, which state will get what. I think that is not the spirit of uh, federalism. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the session surcharge also has had a, a, a negative effect on state subjects like health, education and agriculture. I'll give you uh, the example. Let's say the education cess, which was introduced, I think, in 2003-04. Now, if you look at the budget allocation of education before the cess was introduced, which is coming, coming from entirely from the uh, central government's uh, share of the resources, after taking the cess together now, it is again remaining almost at the same percentage of a level uh, compared to the GDP, which basically means the, the, the center collected the cess and surcharge and palmed it off through uh, education and, and, and health is even worse uh, and, and saved its own resources. And at the same time, the GST has switched the powers of the states to it as any other resources except the non-tax ones. What is is in a good position because of its non-tax base, but most other states will not be. The last point is, you know, in, 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 this, uh, in this scheme of uh, competitive uh, federalism, uh, you, you know the aspirational uh, districts uh, uh, the Niti IO has, has brought in. There is no fin extra financial resources being given. There is no extra human resources being given. It is just a group of monitors who come uh, from the central government to the state government and tell that, uh, and use the collectors, the same state functionaries, and have an electronic dashboard to tell them that you are doing better than the uh, other. Now, uh, I, I have demanded many times that if you're talking, if you're thinking of improving the aspirational districts, let's say Malkangiri to come down to the level of Purda district in Orissa, then, then you uh, at least make the resources transfer from 60-40 ratio to 90-10 ratio that you're giving. That is also not happening. But what is happening is that the central, through the Niti Ayo, is, is, is coming over to the states uh, to, to, to enforce the way the programs will be executed in the state. Now, this kind of an approach, overall approach in this competitive federalism has become a uh, centralization of revenue. I talked about it because session surcharge is increasing, divisible pool is decreasing, Orissa's share, for example, even horizontally uh, it has reduced, vertically has reduced. The, 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 uh, the, the one size fit all strategy, which we are all, uh, you know, uh, we have all agreed that doesn't really work, is actually being is being eschewed in the sense uh, the aspirational districts, the government of India decides what well, well, this is how you should do the scheme. This is how you should do the scheme. Once the money has been transferred to the states, I see no reason why the state government cannot decide which is the priority in let's say Malkangiri or in Navarangpur or in Korapur. So I think I think the the, the concept of uh, competitive federalism, uh, uh, you know, I, I think conceptually it is not really going to uh, uh, deliver uh, uh, or improve the backward states to a level in which they they can compete with the uh, more advanced uh, states. Let's say Orissa facing disaster uh, every year uh, as a cyclone and a flood. Now the disaster response that comes by way of let's say certain grants uh, is mostly in the nature of uh, post-disaster relief or some amount of little more money than that. But what happens to the disaster resilient infrastructure that is required to be set up? The, uh, in, the, in the funny cyclone, we lost about one lakh electric poles. Uh, so we said that, uh, our CM said that we must have underground cabling of power infrastructure. Now that is a huge amount of money. So post disaster reconstruction is something which the states have to fend for and what are the resources for it so i don't really think that this competitive federalism uh, notion is is is, 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 is is at all a great idea i have uh, aired it in the parliament too and i still feel that 
let us go to the drawing board and look at the backward areas, the backward states, and some of those schemes which were there from before, we, 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 we rubbish them by saying that it hasn't really delivered. I don't think the current uh, way also it is going to deliver anyway. If you are competing, if you are competing, Orissa's health infrastructure with Delhi's infra health uh, infrastructure, does it make sense? Absolutely not. Uh, so with this, I'll rest my, uh, my, my submissions. Uh, and uh, excuse me for really uh, rushing to the um, bus to take the, um, uh, the bus to the airport. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik. And thank you for making the time. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Milbrad to please give us your views, uh, how you see uh, cooperative federalism as a concept and what you see of India. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, you know that we have a, a very peculiar form of uh, federalism, especially in some sort of institutionalized uh, corporatism uh, in uh, Germany. That is due to uh, the distribution of internal powers between uh, uh, the Federation and uh, the states. Uh, we have not uh, uh, so much a, a competitive system uh, like uh, those federations who are uh, very separate levels. Let's say the, uh, the United States uh, where uh, uh, the political areas are distributed between uh, federation and states and uh, the states and the federation have the um, possibility and uh, um, uh, to legislate, to execute their own uh, laws, uh, uh, to uh, fund their programs uh, and uh, to raise their own uh, taxes in, uh, more or less independently. Uh, in our system, uh, uh, we have, a uh, first of all, a division of powers concerning legislation. Um, uh, uh, the states, um, uh, uh, the, the federation has a, a short list of uh, 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 federal, uh, exclusive federal legislation, uh, which is normally uh, in all other uh, constitution as well. Then we have a very comprehensive list of, um, uh, um, uh, of uh, shared or uh, a concurrent uh, legislation. Um, the uh, peculiarity is that uh, the states are only allowed to use uh, uh, the uh, uh, concurrent list if uh, the federation has not uh, used its powers. In the end, um, uh, there is a preponderance of uh, federal legislation. All uh, items which are not in the, in the two lists are uh, exclusive uh, um, competences of the state concerning legislation. Um, however, uh, concerning administration, execution of laws, uh, we have a different system. Um, uh, the states uh, execute not only their own laws, the, um, but also federal laws as well. And so, as the Constitution says, in uh, uh, its own right, with little federal supervision. Only in special cases, federal laws are executed by the states uh, on federal commission or by the uh, federation itself uh, uh, by their own administration. Internally, the states have uh, transferred most of the administrative tasks to the municipality, which are part of the um, uh, of the states. Ra um, to give you an impression of uh, the distribution of administration, 80% of all public employees are um, employed by the states and the municipality, only 10% by the federation. The, uh, the, the, the rest is uh, uh, are employees of the social security system, which is uh, self-governed. Uh, Therefore, uh, the Federation has no boots on the ground and depends more or less on the state. Uh, each level has to pay for its administration by the revenue and special taxes which are allocated to them. Um, the, uh, the Constitution gives a list of the taxes. Uh, some are uh, federal taxes, others are state taxes, and some are uh, municipal taxes. The most important tax is VAT. Your GST, 
uh, income tax and corporation tax are joint taxes which are shared by uh, quotas fixed in uh, the constitution. To balance this complex system, um, federal laws which affect the states and local administrations and especially their budgets are voted not only by the elected parliament, but on, also by the federal council, uh, consisting of delegated members of the state governments, including the state, Mr. Presidents, your chief ministers. The member of state governments, as well as those of the federal governments, may address the federal parliament. The federal Council has many similarities to councils of ministers in international organization or the European Union. Because of this uh, central position, the Federal Council convenes a day every three weeks. Its decisions are prepared by standing committees consisting of state line ministers and their deputies. The respective federal ministers and senior federal and state officials are present as well. So it's a um, uh, dealing between administration on the level of um, uh, the Federal Council. To facilitate this process and to hold permanent contacts with the federal ministries and federal parliament, each state has a representation in Berlin with, state, um, uh, with a state minister or a state secretary as head and dozens of specialized officials as a sort of embassy. Besides the Federal Council, there are a lot of regular conferences of uh, uh, state uh, uh, minister presidents or line ministers to coordinate interstate cooperation, defend common interests and exchange opinions. Uh, sometimes with, sometimes without their, respected, uh, their respective federal colleagues. As only nationwide parties gained seats in the federal parliament, which fund exceptions, the nationwide parties itself are federalized along the structures of the federation. Due to this system of overlapping competences in legislation and administration, Germany needs this form, this intensive form of political and administrative cooperation compared with system based on clearer separation of competence. Our form of cooperation is time and resource consuming, but often stabilize the political system as opposition parties have indirect political influence on federal policies via states. Political observers might have the impression that Germany is governed by a permanent grand coalition of the main parties. However, too much cooperation can blur responsibility and accountability be harmful uh, to democracy and good governance and slow down the introduction of needed reforms. To streamline this system, which uh, uh, only a few elements of uh, competition, uh, we tried in 2006 and 2009 to reform the constitution by debundling competences especially by shortening the concurrent list to increase the competence of state legislature and uh, as a swap to diminish the influence of state governments on federal legislation by reducing the cases where consent of the federal council in legislation, federal legislation is required and thereby increasing the power of the federal parliament and government. Unfortunately, it was not possible to agree on a fundamental reform on the constitution. Only some amendments were passed as first steps. Uh, some um, uh, co-financing program uh, were uh, uh, reduced or uh, skipped, uh, especially uh, uh, the co-financing by common task where uh, the uh, federation uh, uh, had some influence on uh, state um, expenditures. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, forbid uh, direct uh, uh, financial links between uh, the federation and uh, the municipal level. But as I said, we only reduced it by, uh, by, uh, by um, 
a certain amount, but it was not a real uh, reform. Uh, it was planned as the first steps uh, uh, toward the aim of having more compet uh, competition in the system. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, more steps forward were not taken. And on the contrary, sometimes a step backward was made. To sum it up, um, cooperation is positive, good and necessary, uh, but too much is harmful. And uh, I have the impression uh, that in Germany, uh, the balance, uh, the trade-off between uh, competition on the one hand side and uh, cooper uh, cooperation on the one hand side is uh, uh, too much shifted uh, to cooperation. I would personally, uh, because I was a, 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 a chief minister in Saxony, uh, wanted uh, less uh, uh, interference uh, uh, from uh, the central government and more autonomy uh, because of uh, uh, strengthening democracy, responsibility, and accountability. Uh, so um, uh, our system of uh, institutionalized uh, um, cooperation has uh, uh, adva uh, advantages and disadvantages. I was uh, asked to say some words about the European Union. This is still a supranational organization with some federal elements. Europe is still on the way to become a real federation with a responsible European executive, reducing the importance of the member states. The EU is still no union, uh, but a community of states. Therefore, it cannot be a model for India. On the contrary, Europe can learn more from India how to create a functioning union, even if you still want to improve your union further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Milberg, thank you very much. Uh, I would now request Mr. K.M. Chandrasekhar uh, for his intervention. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, you uh, Sumit. Uh, first of all, let me make my tribute to Dr. Vijay Kelkar. Dr. Kelkar, when I first came to Delhi as Joint Secretary, he was uh, Secretary in the Ministry of Petroleum natural gas. And uh, later we still continue to interact. Uh, when I came as revenue secretary in 2004, I found uh, that he had prepared two voluminous documents on direct and indirect tax reform. And uh, many of his uh, suggestions in various fields in economics and administration have really greatly benefited from so I wish you a happy birthday, Mr. Kilkar, and may you live long and happily. Now coming to the subject uh, that is under discussion today, I know that there is shortage of time. You mentioned five minutes for each speaker. Now I would like to make just one point, but in order to make that one point, I will have to go back a bit. You see, at the time of the, after, during, before independence, when this question of, uh, when the Government of India Act, for example, of 1935, was uh, actually contested by many political parties. Uh, they, you see, before independence, the colonial practice was divided and ruled. During independence, the concept changed to unite and rule. So naturally, uh, what happened was that you will see it if you read the constituent assembly discussions. Uh, there was a leaning in favor of stronger unitary control and less federal control. And immediately after independence, as you see, uh, there were 562 states which were grouped into various formations. These were all geographical entities. They were really not uh, cultural. They didn't have cultural identity. So really, they, that was the system that was, and 
even in the Constituent Assembly, when the Constitution was being formulated, at that time too, there was a lot of talk about whether we need a stronger unity structure or a stronger federal structure. And uh, the way the Constitution was drafted, the emphasis has lain on the, on the unitary side, on the central side, rather than on the state side. Uh, this actually, Mr. Govindra mentioned uh, Mr. Veer, the uh, Australian uh, Oxford academic, who has written a lot about on federalism and has defined federalism as he mentioned. Now, he does not agree that India is a truly federal state. He feels that India is a quasi federal state. And then if you see the earlier Supreme Court judgments in the West Bengal case and so on, there again they rule that India does not have an absolute uh, federalism. But this, the whole system, the whole the line of thinking of the Supreme Court changed with the uh, Keshavan and Bharati case, the famous case, in which uh, they said that the fundamental structure of the constitution cannot be altered in India, the basic structure cannot be altered. And in that basic structure, federalism is also included. So now as it is, we are stuck with the federal structure as given in the constitution. The three lists, which has been mentioned repeatedly here. And uh, we are working within the, those confines totally. Now, my own view is that if you really do cooperative federalism, there has to be an evolution of the concept of federalism. It's not just a concept that you take a particular written text and you just implement it. There has to be evolution. And uh, in that process of evolution, new thoughts will come, new ideas will come. Mr. Hilbert mentioned that the work that was done in Germany uh, in the uh, recent past for changing the structure somewhat through constitutional amendments, not entirely successful, but considerably successful. India also, we have made efforts. We have tried to introduce stronger elements of Manchayati Raj, local self-government, not everywhere fully successful, not equally, uh, I mean, the flow of finance has not been there, the flow of uh, resources has not been there, but still that effort has been made. But in order to bring about real change and to make the states and the center work together within with the spirit of cooperative federalism, uh, there needs to be constant dialogue between the two sides. And uh, otherwise, you see, uh, an us versus they approach is inevitable. It has happened. I, I used to remember when I was sitting in the uh, cabinet as cabinet secretary. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on uh, centrally sponsored schemes, how the states are taking credit for schemes so the center should take, get credit. And that was the us versus they approach quintessentially. For India to develop, you need to bring in us and them approach. And that is, requires a great deal of dialogue. As Mr. the Prime Minister himself used to say, we need a concept of Team India. Now that has really not worked out. And whatever machinery we intend to create, mention was made about the Interstate Council. That is uh, there in the Constitution also. But uh, here again, as uh, Going around mentioned that it really not worked successfully. The planning commission was really some sort of an intermediate, primarily because, as he mentioned, they were passing around money. The, uh, there was this cross budgetary uh, expenditure, which was always uh, this, the finance ministry and the planning commission used to compete and contest over it. And that amount was available for development. Increasingly, this problem of uh, the center 
are making inroads into what the state should do. More state central centrally sponsored schemes. This has been a big problem. Now the issue really is that we need to find ways in which we can cooperate. If we stick to a particular structure, cooperation will become increasingly difficult. I worked for a few years in Belgium, and there I found that they had put in place a system uh, of uh, cooperative federalism. We can say they had three provinces: it was Flanders, uh, Wallonia, uh, 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 and uh, the, the the federal capital of Brussels. They also have communities. They are linguistic groups, French, Dutch, and German. And they had a large number of municipalities. And the process of introduction of cooperative federalism was entirely through discussion. They had their first uh, state reform in 1971, the fifth in 2001. This discussion continuously takes place. And as the economy changes, as systems change, as politics changes, more and more changes are reflected in the system of devolution of functions. So that kind of an evolution should be possible in India. We saw in the case of the indirect access that we started with, uh, I mean, we started in the 1990s where we had the excise duties and the uh, state uh, sales taxes. Then it we went on to mod VAT at the central level and state VAT at the state level. Then in the early 2000, 2004 or so, we came in, we got the states, the states of the center agreed on VAT as a concept, which has ultimately matured now into uh, GST. So the same process is important to really make effective and lasting changes with in particularly in a highly diverse country like India with a great deal of diversity, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, you know, every form, even ethnic diversity. So we need to think in terms of how they can be constantly talking to each other. So that's the way I feel. I, mean, I do believe very strongly that decentralization is very important. Even China, if you've seen, it was a National Development and Reform Commission, a central central body like our planning commission. But that focused on decentralization. And decentralization resulted in actual tangible development in China. So we need to look at ways in which we really can make uh, uh, cooperative federalism a reality. And I, I totally agree with uh, our partner that this concept of uh, Competitive federalism makes no sense. That's absolutely true. So I'll stop at this point. Uh, Sumit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now I'd request Dr. Y Yamini Ayer to uh, give us the benefit of her views. Yamini, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to, to this wonderful occasion and giving the chance to celebrate Dr. Vijay Kelkar, who has been uh, an inspiration to so many of us younger scholars um, and uh, uh, so much of your work that we have learned from has framed how we have sought to understand the Indian economy. Uh, but even more importantly, um, how uh, the different uh, elements of the Indian state come together to shape and sometimes unravel the Indian economy. Your writings, your public uh, engagements, what you have said and engaged with in committees, um, it is also a reminder of what, what, what it means to be a true public policy expert. Um, in my capacity as the head of uh, a policy research think tank, I often meet young people who are interested in joining what they describe as the profession of public policy. As someone who spent uh, the bulk of my career in this profession, I'm still trying to make sense of what it actually means. But nonetheless, there are many public policy schools now that have proliferated around the country. Um, and these uh, public policy graduates want to engage in public policy. And I often ask them, what in your view does it mean to be in public policy? 
And the answer is often very limited to uh, things like writing op-eds or uh, engaging on the high table uh, of, of government committees. Uh, but rarely uh, do they actively engage with what it actually genuinely means to be a participant in the process of public policy making, both as a practitioner and an intellectual, and is somebody who shapes the contours of policy debate. And I often point to Professor Kelker as an example of uh, someone whose career they should understand and follow to really fully understand what it means to be a public policy professional. So uh, you not only have you been an inspiration to me, I think you also hold up for me what it means to be in this very odd profession as it exists um, and, and therefore uh, an important mentor and, and an important and, and someone that we look up to and whose career we hope to emulate in different ways and forms. So for me it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite intimidating in some ways to be part of this wonderful uh, forum uh, to celebrate you uh, because I get the chance to talk to somebody whose career has been something that most of us have aspired to. Um, a lot of what you have said and written on uh, federalism has inspired many, much of my own thinking on this question. Um, and it is a fraught one. I think uh, all the speakers before me have pointed out to <clears throat> the many uh, complexities of what federalism involves. Uh, because at one level, it is about power sharing. Power sharing is by definition a political act. At another, it is about cooperation, which brings together uh, uh, political actors that are often on opposite sides of the table into a cooperative discussion or into a co cooperative framework, which is meant to, uh, at least on first principles, enhance efficiency and provide gains on both sides. And as I've observed uh, the practice of federalism in India over these last couple of decades as a policy practitioner, I've also found that often the incentives of autonomy and the demands of cooperation actually in terms of the practice of federalism can leave us with somewhat suboptimal outcomes. And for me, the really big federal challenge is how do we negotiate these two opposing pulls and pressures? For instance, if I think of uh, the challenge of the GST, uh, in principle, there could be no argument. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Kelkar uh, has been at the heart of, uh, of the framing of the GST for India, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that uh, giving up on a degree of autonomy in favor of deeper cooperation will eventually give you high levels of efficiency gains such that the loss of autonomy may be a small price to pay for the gains that, that are in store for us, just on ter in terms of first principles. But when it came down to the active bargaining of GST, even at a time when that consensus was very nearly forged, it does seem to me that the pressures for or the pulls of autonomy resulted in creating a grand bargain, so to speak, that was in more ways than one an imperfect bargain. The compensation cess provided the glue that lured states into coming together. You do need a glue to lure states into coming together. So I don't have an argument against the compensation cess and there were very good economic reasons why it may have been necessary. But at the same time, it created perverse incentives for why states came together. Um, and in some senses uh, that also closed off the space uh, for uh, a political negotiation over certain critical sources of revenue, like fuel taxes, which are now uh, the site of much contestation between center and states, to come into the fold of GST. So we ended up, I think, with the beginnings of what could be a grand bargain, but the tensions of autonomy and the political necessity for maintaining autonomy with the possibilities of cooperation, of efficiency from cooperation, sort of created a compromise that was perhaps somewhat suboptimal. A reminder that perhaps we need to think about federalism, not just as power sharing, but very much as a work in progress. It is actually about a series of political compromises that often lead you to imperfect bargains. And a good federal compact is one that keeps the space open for consistently renegotiating those bargains. Now that renegotiation, I think in the Indian structure is made harder 
Because in some senses, I think that there is strangely a political consensus that goes against the very fundamental principles of federalism. In the sense that if you look at the politics of center state relations across decades, uh, the tendency of centralization has always triumphed over the principles of federalism, particularly in the fiscal space. Uh, the grand old centrally sponsored schemes, which was my first entry into practically seeing the outcomes of uh, an imperfect fiscal federal bargain, uh, one important example of this. But if you look, for example, even at state governments and the complete reluctance of stay on the part of most state governments to devolve to local governments, one can see that in effect, across political formations or political regimes, the temptation of centralization inevitably wins the day in a way that the contestation for federalism is limited to Raja Chaleya's infamous, everybody loves decentralization, but only up to my level. But even in there, and when I followed closely uh, the uh, initial years after the 14th Finance Commission, which made this big push to dev, uh, enhance devolution by moving tax, uh, increasing the divisible pool of de devolution of the divisible pool of taxes from 32 to 42. And in that process in the 2015 budget simultaneously cut uh, some, center, some funds into centrally sponsored schemes. I would have thought that state governments would welcome this move because this is what they had all been complaining about. I had myself sat in many of the uh, uh, center state planning meetings for centrally sponsored schemes and observed the very strange dynamic of government of India secretaries sitting on the stage on the podium and state secretaries sitting in the audience having a discussion about what they how they should work their plans, uh, which just from even that dynamic gave you a sense of who actually had the upper hand. But when it came down to it, and we traced this political speech after political speech, because the Finance Commission recommendations were accepted with the budget in late February, and then many state budgets were still to be passed. Uh, chief ministers who had fought hard with the Finance Commission for Greater Devolution, arguing that, in fact, it's like giving from with one hand and taking away the other because centrally sp sponsored schemes were cut. Um, and in a way, state governments actually, uh, when I started looking more closely and Dr. Rao's work on health finances pointed this out most effectively, the extent to which state governments were actually very deft at using centrally sponsored schemes to substitute for their own expenditure. We know from uh, uh, work by several political scientists, including my own, the extent to which uh, political attribution was effectively drawn from centrally sponsored schemes in the in the era of coalition governments and uh, a genuinely multi-party system that we had uh, until recently, where political attribution was drawn on through centrally sponsored schemes, creating an incentive structure where there was a fair amount of complaining and pushback to centralization, but not enough political consensus to actually put political capital moving the direction forward for deeper devolution and decentralization. And so we got into, and when, we, when it came to the states and local governments, it became even more complex. Um, and this was really brought home to me in a conversation I was having with the 15th Finance Commission when we had done a study on the 14th Finance Commission grants to, untied grants to panchayats. Um, and back at, going back and forth about the extent of to which these funds should remain untied versus tied. Um, and, a, and a comment that was made was, well, you know, it's not really for the Central Finance Commission to necessarily take this on. After all, if the state finance commissions are not interested in devolving, it is, it is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an act of generosity as opposed to an act of necessity for the Central Finance Commission to be doing this. And I found myself arguing very strongly for the Central Finance Commission to give funds for local governments because states were not doing it. Uh, in fact, this is the opposite of what the constitutional amendment mandates in some senses, at least in its spirit, and, um, uh, uh, and goes against also the spirit of federalism. But perhaps you need greater centralization for deeper decentralization. Again, a tug of war of cooperation cooperation that requires constant mediation, constant reshaping and making of compromises. What I worry about when I look at where we are in today's uh, uh, moment, uh, I think that uh, there are two very big 
uh, challenges that India's uh, federal uh, structure is con are, uh, are confronting, or perhaps three, which make the possibilities of this consistent mediation and compromise building and bargaining and rebargaining a much harder task. One, I just think politically, the space for this has completely closed off in that there is at one level a national political party that has less patience with the principle of federalism as a, a tool for accommodation. And when you don't have that patience, you create the space for subnational competition of a kind that has perverse incentives, uh, by which I mean that there is very little reason why state governments that could create a politics that is counter to the nationalized, he hegemonized version of politics to actually then go along with uh, what the central government is asking it to do or to cooperate effectively. So you do see state governments, West Bengal is a good example, Tamil Nadu is another, that are actively pushing back against centrally sponsored schemes or government of India schemes uh, in important ways, closing off the possibility of negotiation. The second reason why I worry is because in fact, the federal challenge is going to become much more complex than it is today. After all, it's not just about haggling over how much devolution or centrally sponsored schemes versus untied funds. It is about a very fundamental challenge that the Indian economy confronts of uh, growth without convergence. So as you're seeing divergence between states, uh, uh, income divergence across states, which is only growing, um, what does it mean then to forge a contract of compromise where richer states are going to have to give a lot more to poorer states? And in that context, the demand of cooperation is actually going to increase quite significantly. And these demands for cooperation are coming at a time when we just do not have an institutional structure for negotiating these bargains. And this institutional structure is not just about politics. It's also about administration. Ultimately, for all its flaws, the Planning Commission had an administrative structure which allowed for a constant conversation between administrators at the center and the state level. The IAS was in conversation. But in the current contestation, as you see the administration, the bureaucracy also becoming increasingly centralized in its approach, the possibilities of negotiating these bargains on the side outside of the obvious posturing that is the theater of politics become even harder uh, to obtain. The bureaucracy is as much, I think today, a player in the game of centralizing uh, as our politics is. And this gives me some cause, actually a significant cause for concern for what the future holds for creating effective sites for mediation, negotiation, bargaining and rebargaining. So I'll stop here in the hope that perhaps all the luminaries here will be able to give us some hope on what kinds of institutional systems or sites we can create, even if the political and bureaucratic environment is pulling against it, because I firmly believe the future of India rests in deeper federalism, not deeper centralization. Thank you, Yamini. As usual, you've been very clear about your views. Uh, now I would request Dr. Ajay Shah, to make his, uh, give us the benefit of his views. Um, Dr. Kelkar, were you saying something? Uh, because oh. I could see your lips move, but uh, you had muted your mic. I was Sorry, saying, no, I was now, now, now we can hear you. I was saying, muttering that I hope Ajay sticks to his time limit given by Zubit. Okay, uh, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep my video off because my Wi-Fi has crashed and I'm riding on my phone and the bandwidth is uh, quite limited. Okay, I want to jump off everything Yamini said. I was thinking on exactly the same lines, but I have a different uh, diagram on a whiteboard which says the same things, which I think may help uh, understand these things better and you know, all of us need to puzzle over them. So... Uh, I want to start at thinking that what is an optimal design? Imagine if you were a omniscient, benevolent central planner, what would be your optimal design of many, many policy decisions all over the country? And then how far is the gap between what real world politics is achieving compared to that optimal scheme? So uh, when we think about the problems of the price system, we always use these metaphors. We think that 
the free market allocation is the optimal one. And then many real world things are deviations from that. So I want to apply that same way of thinking here that there is some optimal ideal world. And then there is the deviations from that world that arise in the practical real world governance arrangement of India. Now, when we come to the ideal optimal world, we have always had traditional arguments in favor of an extremely decentralized approach. Uh, I'm 100% on board that kind of thinking, the subsidiarity principle. And exactly as Yamini said, the divergence that has happened in India really needs to be taken more seriously. That for many decades, we were softly comfortable in the idea that somehow, you know, in the end, convergence is going to happen. That the real world movement of factors, the equalizing differences, building infrastructure will generate convergence. I think it is no longer possible to hope and claim that a convergence process is afoot. There is Gujarat and below the Vindhyas, and that is on a different trajectory compared to the Hindi heartland. I think by now that question has been settled in many, many, many aspects. We inhabit different worlds when we talk in different parts of the country. And so the optimal policy design becomes more and more divergent when you look at different corners of the country. So compared to conditions 20 years ago, 40 years ago, the need for deep decentralization in the optimal policies is greater than used to be the case. Consequently, the welfare cost associated with inappropriate centralization is higher. Okay, so this would be my first pillar of the argument. Proposition two, that the old world had a moral and intellectual authority. Whether you think of Nehru or you think of the world of KM Chandrasekhar and Sumit Bose, it was a level of intellectual capacity and capability where partly good decisions were made and partly those decisions commanded respect. So even when power was centralized, it was done in ways where the decisions were not that inappropriate for many parts of the country. So we may disagree. We may think that a decentralized approach would have been better. But in the good old days, there was a combination of intellectual capacity and moral legitimacy that yielded less bad outcomes. For me, the penny dropped when during the pandemic, I was exposed to discussions around uh, Kerala health policy and in conversations with the Union Ministry of Health, the Kerala crew was openly dismissive of the Union Ministry of Health. They poo-pooed the idea that the Union Ministry of Health knew much about COVID. And they said, look, just leave us alone. We know this shit better than you. And for me, it was really a turning point because in the old days, it was not just force. It was not just money. It was moral and intellectual authority at New Delhi that made a difference. And I think the world has changed compared to that. So that is proposition two, that the moral and intellectual environment today yields less good decisions in a more centralized system as compared to what was happening 20 and 40 years ago. And the third pillar of the argument is the political bargaining that always and always uh, real world public policy is a process of negotiation. And you know it's never that any one answer is correct. There needs to be a give and take. There needs to be a negotiation. And we have all lived through negotiations. We've all lived through chief ministers uh, coming to meet the finance minister, coming to meet the deputy chairman of the planning commission and arriving at side bargains that solve problems in practical ways. And that process has broken down. So I feel that for these three reasons, A, divergence, B, the change in the intellectual and moral uh, edge of New Delhi, and C, the decline of the political process of give and take. For these three reasons, I think that today's institutional machinery is delivering real world answers to the policy process where there is a bigger gap between the reality and the optimum. So if you thought of some optimal policy framework and you think of the reality around us, the gap between the two has gone up. And I fear that this is and will increasingly become a source of sustained poor economic performance. This will shape up as a barrier, as a bottleneck 
to the translation of public expenditures into public goods, into the mechanisms through which the Indian state is able to address market failure and become a valuable part of solving problems. Now, what is the way forward? How do we go from here? Once again, in the short term, I completely agree with Yamini that we are stuck. The process of conversation has broken down. The process of give and take has broken down. I think that the role of everybody in this room is one step removed, that it's not a tactical battle that we are useful in, but there is a strategic story that we can and should and will be useful in that. I think people like us need to reimagine what is the concept of decentralization and federalism in the Republic of India. So to go back to 1935, there was a glorious debate in the INC intellectual community that ultimately led up to the constitution. So there was a mapping from the Government of India Act to the Constitution of India. And we may disagree with the outcome, but the point is there was an intellectual community that led that process and debated their steps to that. And for better or for worse, the thinking of that community led up to some political outcome when the political moment was right. So I am an inexorable optimist about the Republic of India that problems are uncovered, problems are understood, and there will be a point at which there will be a political conversation around addressing these things. And at that time, I think people like us need to have developed the ideas and the documents and the debates. So I'm not here to offer answers. I, I don't pretend to adding value to all of us in terms of our insight on the answers. But I feel that the role for all of us is to keep this pot boiling, to keep up the thinking process and the debating process and start envisioning that we respect and understand Vivekana, the Keshavanan Bharati ruling the basic structure of the constitution. It is very, very difficult to change that. And, you know, that's not such a bad thing. Then given that lay of the land, how would we start changing the formal rules so that we are able to get to better outcomes where the process of public policy formulation south of the Vindhyas going all the way down to cities and villages starts achieving much more self-governance when compared with the way we are today. So I just want to thank Samir Kocher for inviting me here today. And all of you know how from 1998 onwards, my intellectual journey has been argued with Vijay Kelkar at every step of the way. So he's not to blame for all my mistakes, but I made all my mistakes arguing with him every step of the way. And I owe him thousands of good ideas and improvements to everything what I think. That's why I'm happy to be here with all of us today. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, we have Dr. Ashok Lahiri with us. I think he's joined. Uh, so request to you, Dr. Lahiri for your views. Uh, uh, in the about five minutes or now in less. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bose. In fact, it's my proud privilege to be invited in this conference in honor of Dr. Vijay Kelkar, 80th birthday. Dr. Kelkar is almost like a guru to many of us. I still remember how he got me involved and taught me about the hydrocarbon sector back in the late 1990s, and of course, then he used to be passionate about PST and the grand bargain. So let me just uh, reflect on local governments in the context of fiscal federalism. See, local governments, I believe, is a neglected part of Indian fiscal federalism. Most of the time when we talk about fiscal federalism in India, we talk about the center and the states. We forget that the most important role perhaps is played by the local governments, the panchayats in the rural areas and the municipalities and the municipal corporations in the urban areas. Now, as all of us know, the most important thing in fiscal federalism are the three Fs, funds, or first actually functions, Functionaries and funds. It was a slip up, perhaps subconscious. See, as far as functions are concerned, I think 243W or 243G and the 11th schedule 
it has given all the 29 functions to the local governments, the panchayats. So there is a lot that has been assigned, but where we are falling short is functionaries and funds. When it comes to functionaries, the states have retained all of them. And it's the same story, just as the center is somewhat reluctant to pass on to the states, the states are equally reluctant to pass on to the local governments. Since time is just five minutes, let me come quickly to the, apart from functionaries, the other issue of funds. Now funds, if you look at where the local governments get their funds from, there are three sources. One is the Central Finance Commission funds, which gives to the local governments. Second is the State Finance Commission funds, which goes to the local governments. And third is own revenues. Now the central government funds have been quite okay. I mean, it could have been more, but it's quite okay. But when it comes to state government, the SFCs, state finance commissions, it doesn't seem to have been working very well. I mean, there should have been six state finance commissions, somewhere it's four, somewhere it's five. And then state finance commissions also awards are not implemented properly. It's, and the State Finance Commission, I've seen numbers like 3%, 5%, 7% only is allotted there. So that is where I think the own revenues become very important. Own revenues are important not only because they're rupees, but because that increases accountability. Because when I'm spending my money, when you're spending my money, I ask you more questions. Second, it's without conditions. Higher level governments give money to the local governments to spend on particular things. Whereas the local governments can come on their own when it's their own funds. So it is in this context, the question is, what can we do? So we shouldn't forget that the local governments are creation of state governments. They have been created by the states. And then there are various sources. I think Govind Rao and one of his colleagues um, listed some 66 taxes and levies that can be made. But they also noted that many of these levies are actually not uh, collected. So what the 15th Finance Commission did, and this many finance commissions have been commenting on this, that there should be more mobilization of more own revenues. What the 15th Finance Commission has done are two, they are focused on two of them. One is property taxes. Now, property taxes in many of the states is not mandatory. So property tax and how it should be mobilized. I won't get into the details of it. So one, 15th Finance Commission has recommended something about property taxes. And the second thing that they have done which many finance commissions have done is about professional tax, which has remained under a ceiling of 2,500 rupees, I think from 1988 or mid-1980s. It's high time to change it. So I'll end here by saying, uh, firstly, I must apologize for the delay. I was in an ISI board meeting, which continued from 11 o'clock till 7 o'clock. That's the reason it's... <laughs> Shumit Bose will know about ISI Kolkata. <laughs> So I'm late for that reason. And um, thank you very much. And I hope we'll focus more on the local governments in India, because especially in pandemic times, we have realized how important they are in their being the closest to the grassroots level. And they're very important to deliver public services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lahiri. And if I may just add, you spoke about the State Finance Commission some time ago. Uh, the Pune International Center looked at uh, issues of sort of disparities, regional disparities. And at that time, we found that none of the SFCs in the TORs or none of the SFCs in the country has this come up really, uh, except Kerala, uh, that uh, they, they should look at uh, whether one panchayat, which is sort of suffers more disabilities, should get more funds than the others. So the SFC weakness uh, continues. Uh, now, I would request now Dr. Rupak Chattopadhyay to give us his views. Rupak, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bose. Uh, first off, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the Scotch Foundation for organizing this and for inviting 
inviting us to participate. Uh, Dr. Kilker, uh, happy birthday to you. I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Kilker whilst he was chair of the Forum of Federation. And I'm very pleased also to be here amongst friends. Govinda Rao, I worked with very closely when he was uh, director of NIFP. So one of the nice things about being the last speaker is I can cherry pick uh, and bounce off the, the shoulders of others who have already spoken. I, I, I want to make uh, some very brief remarks about, uh, about, comparative, about cooperative federalism, comparative federalism, and what we are seeing now in the post-pandemic uh, era. Uh, the first thing I want to note, uh, bouncing off Yamini Ayer's idea, is that federalism ultimately is a political bargain used to settle conflicts. Every federation is therefore a product of its own unique historical, social, and economic realities. In that sense, no two federations are alike, and there is no such thing as an ideal type federation. On the other hand, uh, as in, in that context, if you want to, one were to think of an ideal type federation, we have uh, two examples at two extremes. We have the American model, the classic dualist model, and we have the German integrated model. The fact of the matter is most federations fall somewhere on that continuum. The other observation I'd like to make is that in, in the 20 plus years that I've worked in the area of federalism, I am increasingly coming to the realization that even the even federalism is sort of a false label uh, because in the course of the last 20 years, you have many countries that have adopted models of multi-level government that look like federalism, even if they don't call it that. Uh, a, a, a very uh, unique example of this is Kenya in 2010, when uh, Kenya decided to go for constitutional reform and to, and to devolve its governance. They looked specifically at the, um, the idea of a classic, what one might consider classical federation, and then created something that was in between. So instead of creating state governments, they created county governments, which have both state functions as well as local government functions. The, uh, the next point I, I want to make uh, is to use sort of a medical analogy. That once you have the institutional structure of a federation, it's very important to then get the right kind of um, resources. So the lifeblood of the federation is finances to make sure that all levels are financed adequately for the functions uh, that they have. Even in an ideal type dualist federation, there is always there, there is always space for interaction between the various orders of government. And this is where it's very important to have the, the appropriate institutions through which to interact. And in that sense, intergovernmental relations is perhaps uh, sort of the, um, the lubricating oil for, for the smooth functioning uh, of, of a federation. In the context of, of uh, COVID, we are trying to figure out what impact this is going to have on federal models globally. We recently, I recently edited a, a, a book that looked at 24 federal countries and how they dealt with the first uh, phase of the pandemic, the period from the start of the pandemic until vaccinations were rolled out. And two things stand out. Countries that did well uh, had very robust mechanisms for apex level intergovernmental coordination between the federal government and the state governments. The other thing that stands out and some people have brought this up, I think uh, uh, Dr. Lahiri just mentioned this, is the role of local governments. Again, the ones that did well had very, very um, robust local government uh, with the ability and the resources to deliver uh, public services. But the, 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 the paradox of all of this is we are now talking about, um, uh, about uh, cooperative federalism, but the fact, but but when, when cooperative federalism uh, as, a, as a concept was first mentioned, it was seen very much as something that was coercive because cooperative federalism, the term was invented in the 1930s during the, the, great, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the great Depression and the New Deal that allowed the federal government of the United States then to use its spending power and other powers to intervene uh, in the social affairs that were the remit of the state. So this was then at that point seen as, as coercive. But the fact of the matter is the United States moved from being a highly decentralized dualist federation from before the civil war 
to one that is relatively uh, more centralized and more cooperative than, than it was at, uh, uh, when it started. In Canada, where I'm based, the Canadian Confederation was created in the aftermath of the US Civil War. And so the Canadians created what was uh, then considered a quasi-federal system, something and label that's been subsequently applied to India. Uh, but what has happened over the course of the last 150 years is whereas the United States has moved more towards a, uh, a cooperative model, in Canada, we have moved in the opposite direction. And this is, again, a function of the nature of uh, finances. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the, the, the states have become more reliant on federal transfers, whereas in Canada, most states raise about 90% or 100% of their own, own revenue. And, and federal transfers are actually, until the pandemic, were a very, very small amount, about 7% or so of, of, uh, uh, of, of the federal budget. And, and this allowed for a different kind of federalism to emerge. And the lesson from this is, uh, again, I think uh, it was Yamini Ayer, or I, I can't remember who mentioned this, the idea of keeping in mind that one, that, that federations are works in progress. They evolve and change with time. And so I think over time, almost every major federation, well, most major federations that I've worked in have gone through some period of looking at it, you know, a comprehensive, having a comprehensive view on how to, how to um, overhaul their constitutions and their institutions to see if they're fit for purpose, even if sometimes constitutional reforms don't uh, follow through. Now, uh, far, far be it for me to uh, comment on, on, uh, uh, on, on the processes in India. But the thing that really struck, has struck me over the years is even though there have been constitutional reform commissions in India, unlike, the, uh, unlike what has happened in other parts of the world, there's been virtually no political engagement on these issues. And, and I, I think given that federalism is ultimately a political bargain, uh, there was some talk about optimality and uh, suboptimal outcomes. I think this has to be viewed in terms, I mean, the, the optimality of having a federal structure has to be viewed in, in terms of the opportunity costs of, of what would happen, uh, or what disasters might befall a country if there weren't, fed, if there weren't federations in terms of conflict, social, uh, uh, you know, social, uh, social disorder, so on and so forth. Uh, but I think, uh, I, I think as India has evolved since, 1947 and 1950, and certainly since the, the, the Government of India Act uh, of 1935, I think the, 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 the greatest contribution intellectually one could make or think about is actually having, some, uh, having, a, having a political dialogue on seeing if India's current institutions are fit for purpose. They may be, but no one has really had that dialogue at the political level. There have been judges who've uh, who have you know had uh, sort of um, committees which are technocratic committees, but but to me to me this is insufficient and certainly out of step with what many other countries have done: older federations, uh, richer federations, more resilient federations. And I think this is a this is this is a good opportunity to start that uh, open up the space for a political dialogue on looking at the uh, looking at whether India's institutions continue to be fit for purpose. So I'll, I'll end my comments here. Thank you. Thank you, Rupak. Thank you. Uh, I think a bit of a political dialogue did take place with this GST council and the entire effort of GST. Um, but you're right about the other, other institutions. We've been all eagerly awaiting uh, Dr. Kilker's views. And uh, uh, sir, I would request you for your views. Um, uh, Sumit, let me first thank all our distinguished uh, speakers. I think they each one of them made extremely important, rich contribution. It's not easy to uh, sort of, it's very difficult to add something new, what you have said. I, I have somewhat different concern when we decided to have this uh, uh, conversation uh, between me and uh, uh, Mr. Kocher. I was really motivated by one major, major concern which I have got, which is the uh, 2026 is going to be the year of delimitation of constituencies in India. And I think that's going to be a technocratic shift in India's federal structure. It will remind. It's going to change distribution of political power amongst regions. 
than what has been stayed for the last 60 years, 70 years, 75 years. So I think now is the right time to start this conversation, to prepare ourselves better. How do we handle this tectonic change? What institutional strengthening we require? How do we ensure that cooperative federalism remains as the sort of um, uh, alive, so to speak? Because uh, I'm extremely, extremely worried that if you don't, if you don't think in advance, and that is the hallmark of a, de of a developed country, in my view, that you do it in preparation, in anticipation of the crisis, not the after crisis. I think I can see that this is right on the horizon. So I think uh, this today's meeting has raised many important issues, and we have started, made a beginning towards that. Uh, and uh, I really look forward uh, uh, to uh, two concrete proposals I would suggest for your consideration to our friends, is that uh, take the point made by uh, Dr. Govind Rao about institutions and see whether we can think about institutions to take care of this change which is coming up, a seismic change in Indian uh, federalism. And second, uh, I think uh, what we immediately we can do is uh, how do we ensure the state government get larger flows, and I think we should recommend that uh, the, in future, I think surcharge and CSS should be shareable with the states. That's, that's one way of ensuring that we probably can increase the uh, resource flows to the states. And that I think is a uh, one concrete proposal we can make if people are willing to consider what we're making, saying it. But I once again want to thank each one of them and for the very, very gracious and very, very kind uh, words they spoke about me, but uh, it really has been a great learning journey from, for me. And I, I learned from each one of you, and each one of the participants today, I have learned each one of them. So I want to thank them once again for their generosity, their friendship, and I continue to look forward to engage with them. So let me give the floor back to Sumit. Thank you, sir. And, uh... Uh, what I've learned from you, the years of association, is that is the optimism in public policy making. You've always been optimistic about the outcomes, and uh, and and even now, as you talk about uh, uh, the the future of our uh, federal structure, uh, you are optimistic that solutions will be found. I think that's the that's the real hope, and and that's the real way forward, sir. As you've said, and and and, and uh, so I, I'm sure. Uh, Samir and all of us will put together some concrete suggestions uh, uh, from uh, today's discussions, as you suggested. Samir, are we concluding now? Or you had said to we, we can, we can uh, conclude now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, eminent panelists. And if you could uh, sort of, I think, suggest some bit. Uh, steps to be taken if then we could put those together it would be of immense help thank you very much it's a pleasure i would you know get this transcribed and i'll send you a draft sumit maybe you would like to convert that into a proceeding and some recommendations sure. thank you very much it was a pleasure hosting you all this evening and thank you for joining us thank you happy birthday again dr gill thank, thank you sir thank you sumit Happy birthday, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.